Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor. I'm Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, and I'm delighted to welcome to you to our Labour, Literature and Landmarks Lecture Series. We very much appreciate your support and are so pleased that you can join us here this evening. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. We are a non-profit organization and today our 236 year old organization continues to serve the people of New York City through our various educational and cultural programs. These include um, our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, um, our uh, lecture series, of course, of which tonight's lecture series is part of, our General Society Library, and our Mechanics Institute, a tuition-free educational program. I want to mention that after the presentation, we will have a short Q&A of 10 to 15 minutes. So please submit any type questions uh, during any part of the program and of course at the conclusion of the program. And we will try to get to as many as possible. And we would ask you to use the Q&A option rather than putting your hand up. We have been fortunate enough to partner with the New York Landmarks Conservancy on many landmark lectures, in course, including tonight's talk. And in fact, I double checked today when we started partnering with the Conservancy, and it was in 2014. My goodness, the time has gone so fast. And I want to express our great pleasure in this partnership. And I am delighted to welcome here this evening a person who many of you will already be familiar with, and that is Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And Peg is going to introduce our speaker. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. And it's the Conservancy's pleasure to be part of this series too. You know, I like to remind people that preservation is don't save buildings because we have a brick fetish. We do it because of the people who are involved with them and because buildings tell stories. Mark Hauser has captured the engaging stories of the people who commissioned many of our earliest skyscrapers here in New York and across the country. For instance, Mark takes us from Frank Woolworth's early days as a failed sales clerk in upstate New York to his ability to pay cash for an office building modeled after the Houses of Parliament. Mark describes the business tycoons in his book as yesteryear's iteration of Silicon Valley computer geeks, people who transform their cities and society in ways that are still felt today. They had their critics too. Imagine the Flatiron Building was denounced as appalling, a disgrace to our city. To many residents, these were the controversial super talls of their day. I met Mark over the phone last year when he was doing a profile of my hero, Pittsburgh preservationist Arthur Ziegler. Our conversation led to my reading a proof of this book and hardly recommending it. Now it's nice to meet Mark on Zoom. Mark is an award-winning journalist and a serious architecture buff. He's given us a new angle. Instead of the usual focus on the architects, Mark introduces us to some of their high-powered clients. Mark Hauser. Thank you so much, Peg. Uh, it's so flattering to have someone as a, as accomplished as an important uh, and as important in the in the world of historical preservation to not only introduce me but to have read my book and of course given me such a generous blurb for it. I thank you. That's pretty near indescribable. And thank you also, Karen, for inviting me to speak to you all tonight for this uh, Landmarks Lecture for the General Society. It's my pleasure and honor. Historic preservation is very important and I like to think my book is a small contribution. Each of the buildings in my book have been preserved. They are still standing and you can visit them. They're mostly uh, now designated historic landmarks. So I hope you'll consider coming out uh, and seeing some of the buildings that uh, I detail in my book, the 55 skyscrapers. Most of them are in close 
or appear to be close to their original condition. So um, I hope you all enjoy the, the presentation and as a bribe to hopefully uh, keep you paying attention, I will be giving away two signed copies of my book at the end of the presentation to the two best questions as judged completely subjectively uh, by myself. So we're gonna be taking a coast to coast tour looking at some of the very best antique skyscrapers in the USA and as the title says in the world. So this, uh, it, the book has in addition to 50 US skyscrapers, five bonus international skyscrapers. And uh, if you see that photo of me here in this uh, introductory slide, that's me on the roof of the world building. So that's in Vancouver. Like many books, or like many buildings in my book, it is now re-emerging from years of neglect and uh, undergoing a major renovation. When I visited, they were replacing not just uh, a lot of the interior or fixing the interior, but they were replacing the old roof tiles and they were kind enough to give me one. So I'm not quite sure how I got this through airport security from Seattle, but now I have that souvenir, which I suppose I can use as a cheese board. Um, Skyscrapers, of course, started in New York and Chicago. Um, so on the cover here, we see uh, the, the, a photo from the cover of Harper's Weekly, which is called Cowboys of the Air. These, those guys are on the Liberty Tower in the Financial District. So here's New York. View of the skyscrapers from the Hudson in 1912. So you can see on the left, Peg mentioned the Woolworth building. Um, that's finishing up in this, at the time of this photograph, colorized photograph, and it would be ready to open the following year. Now, the second tallest building you'll see there is, uh, is the Singer building, which is no longer existent, and which makes me kind of sad because what replaced it was uh, a building that came from my hometown of Pittsburgh, the headquarters of US Steel. I should say um, the Woolworth building would be the second tallest structure in the world at the time of this image. The tallest would be the Eiffel Tower, which would uh, basically reach the top of the image. And when we look at this image, it seems very nostalgic and old fashioned and charming. But actually I want to argue that it is a representation of high technology moving at a blistering speed. And why I say that is because of this building here, the Park Building. Now, the Woolworth Building in 1912 is the world's tallest skyscraper, but the Park Building was the world's tallest skyscraper in 1899, and the Singer Building was the world's tallest skyscraper in 1908. And if the person taking this picture had a time machine and could go back 40 years, none of this would be here. The tallest building in this picture then would be Trinity Cathedral's steeple, and that is hidden behind this building here. What if you and I had a time machine and we could go back 40 years to 1981? How different would our cities be in 1981? I remember 1981. We were already bored with the moon landings in 1981. You could fly in the Concorde to Paris in 1981. Keep in mind in 18. Uh, 72, from 1872 to 1912, that 40 year time span, people lived through the invention of powered flight. They saw cars come onto the streets, telephones. These people went through a lot of drastic changes in their lifetimes. And some of that is symbolized by skyscrapers. So guess what? I have a time machine. We can go back 40 years from this image. So let's jump in. In fact, we can go back further to 1853. This is New York from the top of a temporary wooden tower that was built for the World's Fair in 1853. In the very far distance, you can see the tallest thing in Manhattan. Well, except in this image, the temporary tower is a little taller than Trinity Cathedral steeple. But what you see in this image is around 42nd Street where Bryant Park is now. That's the Murray Hill Reservoir. And next to it is the World's Fair's Crystal Palace. And inside there, the fairgoers, you can see them in the foreground, are coming in to see an exhibit of the world's first passenger safety elevator demonstrated by an inventor named Elisha Otis. 
who had his assistants haul him up on a freight elevator 50 feet above the ground and then cut the rope and everyone gasped. But instead of plummeting to his death, the brakes on this elevator stopped it immediately. And things, even after the invention of that elevator did not change overnight. On the left, you see Broadway. This is an illustration from 1868. And you'll notice that the buildings are all of a uniform height. They're all about five stories tall on the big thoroughfare there. And that is because five stories is about as far as anyone wants to walk up. So stairs limited the heights of building more than technology. And if you wanted to see a panoramic view of New York, well then, you went to Trinity Church and went up in the steeple. This is a view from that time machine 40 years before 1912. This is what you would have seen if you looked up Broadway from Trinity's steeple. Not a skyscraper to be seen, just other steeples. And here is where it all begins. This is Broadway again. This is the great technological leap. It is the world's first 10-story office building. So this was for Western Union, the telegraph company, opened in 1875. Now, most people don't classify this as a skyscraper because it's not a steel frame building, it's brick and stone. And uh, it's, uh, it's got some iron support columns in it. But anyway, this was the new headquarters of the world's biggest telecommunications company. So it was a big deal in 1875, the world's first 10 story office building. They're laying cables across the ocean. Now that's been demolished a long time ago. But it's still with us in a, in a way that you all know. It was, maybe you don't know that you know, but the Western Union headquarters on Broadway was connected by uh, cable to the National Observatory in Washington. And every day on a signal from the observatory, they had a painted wooden ball up on the spire at the very top of the building that would slide down to indicate exactly when it was noon, according to the National Observatory. So that's how you set your pocket watch or your clocks. And of course, we still have this tradition of watching the ball drop at New Year's Eve. Happy noon. So skyscrapers are going up like dandelions after 1900, even before 1900. And, and so that steeple at uh, Trinity doesn't have much of a view anymore, as you can see here in this postcard image. It's sort of blocked uh, by some new skyscrapers in the financial district. So if people wanted a view, they climbed up here to the top of the Woolworth building, or rather they didn't climb, they, for 50 cents you could ride an elevator to the top of it. And on the left you can see, just make out these folks, these ladies with their fancy hats, standing at the railing on the top of a building more than 50 stories tall. Frank Woolworth, as Peg mentioned, uh, was not born rich, he grew up on a potato farm in upstate New York on the shores of Lake Ontario and, and he hated life on the potato farm so he became a store clerk, which he also found he had little talent for, but what he did have a talent for is display. And so uh, he started out with the shop he worked for uh, displaying items for five cents. And uh, that was such a hit that he decided to spin off and start his own business of selling things for a nickel or a dime and making a penny profit on each of those sales, eventually created a, a retail empire across the country and uh, eventually was able to build the world's tallest skyscraper. And it's not just the tallest, but it is spectacular. It, it is, has to be the most ornate, dazzling lobby of any skyscraper in New York for my money. And if you go inside and have a look, uh, you'll see on one of the supports there that next to these beautiful mosaic ceilings and veined marble everywhere. A, a little grotesque uh, support statue gargoyle thing of Frank Woolworth and all of the people involved in the construction, uh, you know, even the accountant. Um, but there's Frank Woolworth portrayed counting nickels and dimes. So it also shows you the man had a sense of humor. Um, another grotesque you can see there is uh, Cass Gilbert who was the architect who built this building. And uh, he, he uh, famously stated that a skyscraper is a machine to make the land pay. So that building, uh, only two stories of it involved the Woolworth uh, offices and the rest of it was all for rent. 
This is the view, by the way, from the top of the Woolworth building. And this is 1915. So remember, 40 years before this picture was taken, they were putting the roof on the world's first 10-story building we saw earlier. 40 years later, this is what you have in New York City. The Singer building uh, is the illuminated cupola in the, or in the center there. But um, next to it, on the other side of Broadway, there's a modern looking large building with all the lights on up above. And that is the Equitable Building. It's the second Equitable Building actually. Um, and it's in this picture, it's, it's brand new. It's, it's the biggest building in the world by or office building in the world by floor space. It had more than a million feet, square feet of leasable space. This is Henry Hyde. He founded Equitable. He was, uh, this is a picture at age 30. As a young man, he came to New York about 1850 from the Catskills where he grew up. Um, he was seeking his fortune in what was then a relatively new industry, life insurance. And so he got a clerk along with his dad and his teacher at a company called Mutual Life. And there he might have stayed, except that when he suggested to his boss at Mutual that they go in together on a business that would court a higher wealth client, client um, he was instantly fired by his boss. So to show you the kind of dogged, persistent person he was, what he did was Henry Hyde went uh, and leased the upstairs offices in the same building, started his new company called Equitable and hung out a bigger sign above his old employer. This is that original office. And he really focused on training his agents in an era when that was not, uh, that was not common. Uh, he introduced sales conferences and would poach the best agents of his competitors. And soon he had a, quite a thriving insurance company and it was ready for its own headquarters. And so by 1870 with equitable holding assets of more than $11 million in 1870 money, I got his board to sign off on the first office building in the world with elevators. So if you see this ticket here, it boasts that they have steam elevators. Um, this is a giant building for its time. It's not quite a skyscraper, it's eight stories tall. It looks like it's only four, but uh, back then before skyscrapers, there was a move or, or, or rather the urge was to make it seem that a building wasn't too tall. So each of those bays is two floors, though they look like single windows. Um, the elevator design job, by the way, fell to an architect by an engineer by the name of George Post. His next job was the Western Union building. So he also designed uh, the world's biggest building at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. He became one of the great early skyscraper architects. Um, on the right is a design by Daniel Burnham. Daniel Burnham was the Chicago architect who organized the, the World's Fair in 1893 that uh, Post and uh, other great architects designed buildings for. Um, this was a successor, proposed successor building to the Equitable Building. Uh, Henry Hyde wanted to get rid of his eight-story building eventually. He died in 1897, but the company kept his dream alive. Uh, this uh, illustration is a, a proposed 62-story concept by Daniel Burnham from 1908 that would have been the tallest building in the world had it been built. It would have, with that flagpole, it would have passed the Eiffel Tower. It wasn't built. Uh, in 1912, the Equitable Building, the original, burned down in a major fire, a fatal fire that uh, threatened to burn the entire financial district. It was in the wintertime. You can see the aftermath there with the icicles. And the company directors after that decided they wanted to get out of the real estate business. So they sold their uh, block to another uh, industrialist, Coleman DuPont, who wanted to open a new uh, field of endeavor. He was, wanted to get away from the family dynamite business and uh, gunpowder rather and, and business and get into real estate. So he, uh, he bought that property and built a new skyscraper and leased it to Equitable, became Equitable's landlord for a while, eventually bought Equitable, and also tried to run for president. Um, and here's the building that he built. It's now called 120 Broadway, uh, but it's called the Equitable Building originally. No expense was spared uh, then or now 
Um, it was recently renovated by its owner, which is Silverstein Properties. Uh, they spent, they just finished, a, I believe, a $50 million restoration of the entrance facade. Um, the interiors, they put the Bankers Club, the uh, private club back on the roof. Anyway, when this building opened, people were furious. Why? Because the walls just shoot straight up from the sidewalk and they're almost 50 stories high. It was 38. So even at noon, this building has a shadow that's four blocks long. So a year after it opened, New York passed the world's first zoning ordinance in 1916. And a key part of this ordinance was requiring setbacks in the exterior walls of new construction that would allow more sunlight and fresh air down to the people on the sidewalks. So this stepped back shape that eventually became the signature uh, form of the Art Deco skyscrapers that would follow that was mandated because of this very building. And this is a study uh, before the ordinance went into, uh, went into force, but this was how the equitable building would have looked if the setback ordinance had been in effect when it was built. So it's based on formulas and uh, how wide the street is that's surrounding it. The dotted lines show the building's actual shape and the solid lines show what would be allowed. <laughs> you see it looks kind of like an ocean liner with a big fat smokestack. Um, but incidentally, I, I, I spoke to uh, the chief marketing officer at Silverstein Properties that owns this now. And he told me last week uh, something I didn't know. The Department of City Planning has its headquarters and its public hearing offices in 120 Broadway, the equitable building. So in other words, the building that caused there to be a Department of City Planning is now the home of the Department of City Planning. And those setback rules, by the way, wouldn't change every building. Here's, here's one you might recognize from its shape that wouldn't have changed at all. Of course, that's the famous Fuller Building. Uh, poor George Fuller. People just loved calling his building the Flatiron Building instead of the uh, Fuller as it's named for him. Um, but you can see the streets are so wide here, Broadway and Fifth Avenue, that uh, the setbacks would not have affected the lovely Flatiron Building, which is why so many New Yorkers loved it. But not all of them, as Peg had said earlier, if you think people hate it, hate now the new super tall buildings in Manhattan and, and in Chicago and elsewhere. How about this quote? This is from a noted sculptor who's highly respected in the city, William Partridge. He says, the Flatiron Building is a disgrace to our city, an outrage to our sense of the artistic and a menace to life. Those are rough words. And it wasn't the only Flatiron Building. I like this newspaper column called Between the Flatirons. There's a second Flatiron Building in New York City. That's the New York Times Building on 42nd Street that Times Square is named for. And it still stands there, but Good luck finding it because it is covered with big giant flashing neon video signs. On the right, by the way, you see uh, George Fuller's successor at his company, the Fuller Construction Company and then US Realty, Harry St. Francis Black and his young bride, Mrs. Harry St. Francis Black, which I think that's incredible. What are the chances these two people with the same name met? But, uh, Actually, this was the boss's daughter, George uh, uh, Fuller's daughter was Alan Fuller. And if he hadn't found her though, he could have stopped in to visit one of the tenants at his Flatiron building, which this newspaper, if you're looking, uh, talks about the uh, Bohemian, Bohemia Guide Society, which for just $5 a day will allow gentlemen to hire a bright and competent female companion uh, she described as cheerful, clever, chatty young woman will point out the sights of metropolis and ably discourse on the beauties of art and architecture. So there was that in the Flatiron Building. Uh, you were looking for a guide. This is the kind of bachelor that the Bohemia Guide Society was probably looking for. Um, this is a young, single, rich, powerful James Gordon Bennett Jr., son of the founder of the New York Herald had its own square, Herald Square. This is his Bennett building on Nassau Street. And it's in my book. It's the oldest building in my book. 
because it is the world's only 10 story cast iron office building. So cast iron construction, as many of you know, is a pre-skyscraper technology. It, it mimics the look of uh, expensive stone or carved marble if you paint it. And it, it's a nice facade. It eventually uh, gave way to more modern technologies and stronger technologies. But when uh, Bennett had this building built, uh, actually it was just six stories tall. There wasn't the technology to build a 10 story cast iron building uh, in I think 1873 when this was originally built. So you can see the edge of the top of the building as it was originally constructed. I promise you it's six stories. This bottom story is not painted. So the retail level story is kind of dark and not in my photo. Um, but so uh, the person that he sold it to in 1889, and there was better technology, he put on four more stories and he put a cast iron facade on them to match the original. So you have a 10 story cast iron proto skyscraper. And I put it in the book partly because of this building, mainly because of uh, James Gordon Bennett, because I love his story. This is bravado personified. He was a person who dreamt up publicity stunts to boost the circulation of his newspaper, The Herald. And many people have heard of the story. Uh, he sent a, a, a journalist named Henry Stanley to Africa to find a missionary who was missing. That's the origin of Dr. Livingston, I presume. But that is nowhere close to the craziest thing that James Gordon Bennett did. He lived large. He was the ultimate bachelor playboy. He loved yachting and in 1866, when he was in his 20s, he and two of his buddies, uh, Pierre Lorillard and George Osgood, uh, so they were getting sloshed at the Union Club on Fifth Avenue. And one thing led to another and pretty soon they each had put down $30,000 on a race to see who would be able to sail across to England in their yacht fastest in December. So each of them hired a captain to crew their yacht, but uh, and a crew for the yacht. So Bennett, though, to his credit, was the only one who sailed on his yacht for the race. The other two guys just uh, watched the reports from the cozy security of the Union Club. But Bennett actually sailed across the Atlantic in December with this boat. One of them lost six men overboard to a wave in high seas. So this was hardly you know, a little jaunt across the sea. Um, but Bennett won, and uh, the next year, at age 26, he took over the paper from his father and became the editor and publisher of the Herald. He was also the Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, starting at the age of 29. This is one of his bigger yachts. Eventually, he had a super yacht that had a stable in it for a milk cow so that every day he could have fresh butter and milk. Uh, the milk was for his uh, brandy milk punch, which was his favorite breakfast drink. Of course, he loved the ladies. He was a bachelor, briefly engaged, uh, but he showed up drunk at his fiance's family's townhouse on New Year's Day and relieved himself into their fireplace. And because of that, her brother challenged him to a duel and they went ahead with it, but they both missed. Uh, and nevertheless, Bennett decided maybe it was time to clear out of New York. So he moved to Paris and started the Paris Herald, also helped to start a rival telegraph company to Western Union and laid a separate cable to break uh, Western Union's monopoly, monopoly on their uh, high you know, transmission rates to send the news bulletins back and forth across the ocean. He loved sports. Um, there's lots of great sports stories, but we have more to tell you. But I'll just simply tell you, he started the Westchester Polo Club. He opened the Newport Casino, which hosted the first US tennis championships. There was a Gordon Bennett Cup for auto racing. There was a Gordon Bennett Cup for balloon racing, which still goes on to this day. You can see the first Gordon Bennett Balloon Racing Cup from 1906 right here in this. And then there is a third Gordon Bennett Cup for airplane racing. Now, of course, New York isn't the only city with interesting skyscrapers. So here's another one perhaps you've all heard of. This is from 1891. It gives you some of that windy city spirit. Chicago's big buildings, one of the many things at which we beat the world. And it says, the verdict of the New York press never considered to be over enthusiastic in commendation of Chicago. Is that Chicago more than any other city is due the development of the revolution in modern buildings? Well, you New Yorkers don't really wanna hear more about Chicago, right? 
You want to hear about Cincinnati. So this is the Union Central building, another insurance company. This is uh, in Cincinnati. Cass Gilbert drew this up at the same time he was designing the Woolworth building in New York. And for a while, it was the tallest skyscraper outside of New York and Chicago. And it's also uh, undergoing major renovations. It's being converted into residential units as, as the Woolworth building already has been. And from the roof, a nice bonus is you get to see the Roebling Bridge. Now, John Roebling was a German immigrant who settled in Pittsburgh. And before he did the Brooklyn Bridge, he did bridges in Pittsburgh and then this big one in Cincinnati. By the way, a fascinating story on its own. I did a TEDx talk on that um, and you can find it on YouTube if you take a look also on my website. And speaking of my hometown of Pittsburgh, here is an 1896 skyscraper by none other than George Post, he of the equitable building uh, elevators and the Western Union and so many other things. This is called the Park Building and it was made for the company that became Crucible Steel. And one of its nifty details are those atlases that line the top story and hold up the roof. It's looking down into our lovely mid-century modern park called Mellon Square. At the turn of the century, the last century, this was one of two skyscrapers in downtown Pittsburgh. It's the one in the center, the lighter colored one. So to its right is the Carnegie Building, which is owned by guess who? Uh, also for a steel company. And then past that is the tallest thing in the city. This is the courthouse belfry. The courthouse is by H.H. Uh, Richardson, the last great American architect uh, of the era before skyscrapers. And he considered this building his masterpiece. So in 1900, when this photo is taken, all of these buildings were basically brand new. I'd like to highlight them here just so that you can find them easily in the next photo. And let's jump ahead from 1900 to 1912, which is the same year as that Hudson River skyline image. Wham! Pittsburgh is overrun with skyscrapers from two to more than a dozen over the course of about a decade. This happened in cities all over America, not just New York and Chicago. And that, these are not little trifling skyscrapers either. There are uh, five buildings in this image uh, that are designed by Daniel Burnham. In fact, Pittsburgh has more Daniel Burnham designed skyscrapers, the great Chicago architect than any city outside of Chicago. Um, I can show you where they are. There's this one here. There's this one here. There's this giant one, the Oliver Building. There's this railroad. And there's the Frick Building, which Henry Clay Frick, in a fit of pique over his uh, former, uh, former partner and now bitter enemy, uh, Andrew Carnegie, had Burnham build this skyscraper to block the sun out from Andrew Carnegie's skyscraper. Um, that he brought that same friendly attitude to New York after Carnegie built his mansion on, uh, on, on Fifth Avenue, which is now I think the Cooper Union College, uh, Frick demanded his own mansion on Fifth Avenue that he explicitly said needed to make Carnegie's mansion look like a miner's shack. You can see it today, that's where the Frick collection is held. So I said skyscrapers changed cities across the country immensely. Sometimes it caused cities to rebel and, and bring on height limits. This is one in Boston. This is the Ames building towering over the old state house to many people's dismay. This was built for a family dynasty of shovel, uh, shovel manufacturers. Ames sh supplied shovels to the country when it was growing that for the canal uh, that crossed New York, the, 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 or rather the, uh, <laughs> the, the Grand Canal across New York. Oh heck, um, the, uh, the railroads that crossed the country, prospectors for the gold rush, the, the, the army, the Union Army was a big contractor of the Ames family concern for entrenching tools during the Civil War. And uh, that's Oakes Ames, the son of the company's founder on the left. He became a congressman and his nickname was the King of Spades. Abraham Lincoln, the president, asked the Ames brothers, Oakes had a brother Oliver, also equally influential, and he asked them uh, towards the later years of the, uh, of the Civil War, if they would help him out by taking over a construction project uh, of the federal government that had stalled 
called the Union Pacific Railroad. But unfortunately, that led to a corruption scandal. And uh, Ames here was censured by Congress and went back home to uh, suburban Boston and basically died of a stroke of shame shortly thereafter. Um, so his children went on a spree of construction to sort of resurrect the family name and built this skyscraper, which is about 200 feet tall. And as soon as that happened, the city slapped a 120 foot height limit that stayed in place for decades, which is why Boston is not so full of skyscrapers. Here's Washington DC also has no modern skyscrapers, not because as many people think um, that th there's some law that you can't have a building taller than the Capitol Dome or the Washington Monument. No, the Height of Buildings Act of 1899 was triggered by this one building, the Cairo building. This was built for this dashing man with the, uh, with the bicycle. His name is Frank Schneider. He was a real estate developer who built townhouses and apartments all over Washington. And he built this building right after a visit to the Chicago World's Fair. Now, one of the big exhibits at that uh, fair was a street in Cairo. And so this is sort of themed after Cairo. And the opening looks a lot like a, a, a typical entrance by Louis Sullivan, an architect of Chicago that many of you know. Um, he also built this building in the aftermath of a major personal disaster because uh, his brother lived it was married and lived in a townhouse that Schneider had built and his brother killed his wife, shot her in front of it. They became estranged and so there was a huge trial of the century going on in Washington DC and, and, and Frank Schneider tried to save his brother, he even sort of helped to try to plant evidence that the brother had acted in self-defense and it failed. Uh, and Schneider's reputation was somewhat ruined there. He even appealed to the president but the, for clemency and it was rejected. So this is the front of the Evening Star newspaper on reports of his brother's hanging. And Schneider, after this rough time, went up to relax at the Chicago World's Fair and perhaps came up with the idea for a skyscraper, which he built. And after he built it, uh, uh, Washington DC placed a limit on heights of all buildings. San Francisco has some marvelous antique skyscrapers. On the left is one by Daniel Burnham and John Root, his partner. It's one of their strangest constructions. Both of these are newspaper headquarters, by the way, that were uh, built on the left for the Chronicle, on the right for the Call. Um, and then this happened. So San Francisco had, of course, the great San Francisco earthquake in 1906. And, and even though the earthquake I suspected that all the skyscrapers that had been there fell down, but that's not the case. They were structurally able to withstand the uh, tremors, but they weren't able to withstand the broken gas lines that led to a massive inferno that burned the city. So they had to gut and redo these buildings. And what happened was uh, as they were looking and assessing the aftermath of the damage in the Bay Area, they noticed that there was a building made of reinforced concrete, which was a brand new building technology about that time. It had been built by a, a woman named Julia Morgan. And she's the first woman who had been licensed to practice architecture in California, the first woman to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in uh, Paris. And she had made this bell tower for Mills College that after the earthquake was the only large structure that had no damage at all. So she was contracted to do a lot of the work to fix up the damage after the earthquake and including this gorgeous merchants exchange building where she not only did some structural work in the exterior and interior but also redesigned both this trading hall and left with, and did the interior design to these beautiful murals of uh, nautical themes. And this is the Julia Morgan ballroom on the top floor. By the way, uh, she was very private, but is now widely accepted that she was a lesbian. And she's revered by the LGBT community as a pioneer, of course, as a pioneering woman in a profession dominated by men. And it's nice in this book, I try where I can to find stories uh, where we can tell about people who's uh, from groups that you don't hear so much about from 100, 120 years ago. Um, Julia Morgan had a client, another powerful woman named Phoebe, she was, uh, she had a family fortune from mining and was uh, helping to 
construct buildings at the University of California at Berkeley and, and hired Morgan to do some of those jobs. She also had a son you might have heard of named William Randolph Hearst. This is Phoebe Hearst. Um, her son was a uh, started out in San Francisco with a newspaper and ran into some problems with his mom, Phoebe, because she was uh, pretty strict with the purse strings of the family fortune after, after her husband passed away. And so after the earthquake, um, Hearst wanted to build, as you can see here reported in his paper, this building on the left, the new Hearst building. And what mom was willing to pay for is the building on the right, which I really love the climb down of the headline there, new Hearst building, most complete ever built. Not quite what he had in mind. Uh, the reports when that actual building, which is in my book too, um, when that building went up, the, the news reports in the examiner, Hearst's paper said that it was built structurally to support an additional 10 stories on top of it, you know, should, should the necessity dictate. Of course, that has never been built on it, but he had bigger dreams than he wound up with there. However, he really did uh, get along well with Julia Morgan. And in fact, later asked her if she would, after mom was gone and he had more access to that family fortune that his dad had made in mining, um, he was able to get Julia Morgan to make him a nice little house on the coast near San Simeon, Hearst Castle. So Julia Morgan was the architect of Hearst Castle. There's something else on the coast there. This is uh, City Hall for Oakland. It's by Henry Hornbostel, who was a Pittsburgh architect, but he also did a big bridge there in New York. And uh, that's the one property during my travels that I had the privilege of being locked in. So on the top floor, these uh, slit windows are actually for the city jail. So that's one of the jail cells. Actually, they don't really use it anymore. It's been out of use since the 60s. It's mostly just storage. But uh, right next to me there, that I guess that was quite a view if you were a prisoner in 1910 in Oakland. Here's a great love story. This is Melly and Niels Esperson. Uh, Niels was a Danish immigrant. He was hoping to strike it rich in mining, but uh, that didn't really turn out for him. He met this uh, lovely Kansas girl, Melly, uh, when he was in the Oklahoma Territory and talked her into them going out to Colorado to try and strike it rich with gold, which also didn't work. And also in the bargain, Niels got sick with tuberculosis, but Melly, uh, Melly nursed him back to health. And they tried one more time, this time uh, drilling for oil near Houston and they struck it rich. And they had no children. So they worked together as a partnership and uh, started to diversify their holdings, bought some of the ship canal in Houston um, and invested in building a movie theater and then started to talk about having a skyscraper. And then suddenly Niels had a stroke and died. So Melly built the skyscraper and na named it after her husband, the, the Niels Esperson building. And its design is somewhat based on the Wrigley building in Chicago. Um, this was the tallest building in all of Texas when it opened in 1927. And you can see uh, Melly Esperson had her own private balcony on the roof where she could entertain guests and uh, look down upon her holdings of the Houston Ship Channel. And eventually she had a second building built next door called the Melly Esperson building, which was stood by the side of the Niels Esperson building. And you can see that today too. Another fun love story. Uh, this is uh, George and Louise Bolt. George was a German immigrant, started out as a waiter in New York City. And eventually when he was the head waiter of a private club in Philadelphia, he married the boss's daughter, Louise. And George and Louise Bolt became a great uh, team as uh, innovators in luxury hotels. And their, uh, their enterprises were so successful that George built Louise her own castle in the Thousand Islands, which you can see in that portrait painting of him. Before uh, Philadelphia, he had managed a resort in the Hudson Valley, which you can see there on the left. And in Philadelphia, um, the Bolts opened their own luxury hotel that one of its guests was William uh, William Waldorf Astor. And he liked it so much that he hired Bolt to come up and build a hotel for him in New York, named the Waldorf Hotel, which you can see there in a report on uh, in the right-hand side. This was hugely popular. It opened in 1893. The nouveau riche types 
uh, in New York loved this place because it was expensive, uh, but allowed them to splash their cash and they were treated like royalty. Louise was a key part of this. She understood what the wives of these new millionaires wanted. So they always had fresh cut flowers in the rooms. There were assistant managers on every floor catering to your every request. There was a special ladies tea room, gentlemen admitted only with an escort. Um, and this hotel was so popular that it expanded to fill the block. Another member of the family uh, came on board. It became the Waldorf Astoria. Now it's the site of the Empire State Building. That, that's, this is the original Waldorf Astoria. The Bolts moved back to Philadelphia and opened the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, which you see here, and is one of the loveliest antique skyscrapers you'll find. This French Empire style mansard roof. roof. Uh, you could see in the ad, it was a fun place to be. And the hotel's rocking, don't come a knocking. <laughs> now it's half hotel and half offices. It actually went through a difficult period uh, where it, it uh, was the scene of the, uh, an American Legion convention where uh, 130 people were hospitalized and 29 people died uh, from Legionnaire's disease. So the uh, hotel though still is a nice place you could visit and have a look inside. Miami has a remarkable antique skyscraper. It's called the News Tower. On the left there, you see a different one. That's the, uh, the one on the left is the Coral, in Coral Gables, the Biltmore. But the News Tower on the right was basically ripped off in its design from the Biltmore. Um, it's built for James Cox, an, a newspaper man from Ohio. And he actually got the same architect to come over and build him his skyscraper a little faster. It's smaller than the Biltmore, but they both look like the, uh, the Giralda Tower in Seville. Um, this opened in 1925. Um, Cox was in Miami. He was trying to rest and recuperate after getting hammered in the 1920 presidential election. He ran against Warren Harding and got uh, basically destroyed in one of the most lopsided presidential races in history. The inside is very unique as Spanish architecture. You've got carvings of Gutenberg over the elevators. It's not called the News Tower anymore. It's called the Freedom Tower because after the newspaper had moved out, it was used as a processing facility for the Cuban refugees that were pouring in to fleeing Fidel Castro. I showed you the a picture of me on the roof of the world building in Vancouver. I wanted to also show you another one of the world's greatest antique skyscrapers. This is in a the wonderful city of Liverpool. On the left, that's called the Royal Liver Building. It was for an insurance company. And uh, on the right is an equally amazing building called the Oriel Chambers. And this opened in 1864. It's not a skyscraper. It's only, I think three, no, four stories tall, but it, it's unique for its time. Uh, a local architect, Peter Ellis, pioneered this design of uh, glass, mostly glass curtain walls that you can see there. And if you think that the reception for the Flatiron Building in New York is rough, just have a listen to this uh, London Architectural Journal commenting on Oriel Chambers. The plainest brick warehouse in the town is infinitely superior as a building to that large agglomeration of protruding plate glass bubbles in Water Street termed Oriel Chambers. Did we not see this vast abortion, which would be depressing were it not ludicrous with our own eyes, we should have doubted the possibility of its existence. So Peter Ellis, the architect, uh, did not go on to great fame, but a teenager from Georgia in 1864, his family wanted to get him out of America during the Civil War so he wouldn't be conscripted. His name was John Root and he stayed in Liverpool and studied and he eventually became an architect. And it is believed that he got his idea for projecting glass curtain walls perhaps here, which is one of the first examples of that type of construction ever seen uh, in the world. So we've seen a lot of skyscrapers on this tour and I uh, want to wrap up by showing you two more, my favorites. The first one was built for this man, Haskell Taylor. He's also a New Yorker from Fredonia in Western New York. He started out in the buggy business and then started making supply wagons. 
and his wagons were used for the mining and rather uh, oil drilling operations in Western Pennsylvania. And so he saw how lucrative that could be and got into oil drilling himself, got rich, hit a, hit a gusher of 3,000 barrels a day and got out of the uh, oil business and uh, decided to build an office building in Buffalo. He sold out his oil interest to Rockefeller, had a, uh, a great architect who is just at the peak of his fame, Louis Sullivan, designed this office building for him. And if you have not seen it, you must make a point of going. This is the most beautiful office building you'll find uh, from that era or ever. Unfortunately, Taylor had a stroke just before they announced construction. And so the Guarantee Construction Company of Chicago bought the project from his estate and called it the Guarantee Building. And then they sold the mortgage a few years later, refinanced the mortgage with Prudential. So it became the Prudential building. So it's known as the guarantee or the Prudential. It's not known as the Taylor building, unfortunately, poor guy. But if you could go, it's gone through major uh, restoration efforts by the, the tenant there, which is a law firm, the owner of the building, really. And there's also a lovely museum. You can see the interior has this hypnotic art glass skylight. The fixtures are like nothing you'll see anywhere else. This is really, in my view, a Louis Sullivan's crowning achievement. What, which is my favorite? Well, that's the Smith Tower in Seattle, which opened in 1914 and was the tallest building on the West Coast for a very long time. Yet I'd never heard of the Smith Tower until I started working on this book. And I suspect many of you haven't either. It's named after Lyman Smith, Another New Yorker, a Syracuse uh, businessman. He started out in gun manufacturing, uh, but switched to typewriters. So his is the, the firm that eventually became Smith Corona. And he bought land out in Seattle because it was a booming city and put an office building there and his son continued the project. I love it for a few reasons. One that is that it looks crazy. The, the architects were from Syracuse, so they had not done a skyscraper before and it Seems like they were they were winging it here. Although I've heard it suggested that they're modeling it after the Singer building on Broadway. Um, and it's uh, also has a kid-friendly museum in it. It still has its original human operated elevators though. Uh, they have those buttons on the side. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it is definitely, I can tell you, uh, the guy has to pull the lever to make the thing go and control the speed. And at the top, the reward is a beautiful cocktail bar and picture windows and the best view from a skyscraper that I've ever seen. So what I'm gonna do is share that with you. I know this video is a little jumpy, but bear with me. You can see the view of Puget Sound and the surroundings. So you're surrounded on two sides with mountains. We look down here, off into the distance. I believe those are the Cascades. Now we're looking south. There's the Seahawks Stadium. And Mount Rainier is right there on the horizon. And here is the, our intrepid cameraman trying to figure out where it is. I promise I find it. Here we go. Wham. It's pretty incredible. It's overcast a lot in Seattle, so we were lucky to catch a glimpse of it. And then over here to the west, Puget Sound, and beyond it, the Olympic Peninsula and the Olympic Mountains, and it's nifty Ferris wheel too. It's a majestic view. I highly, highly recommend that you make time to get out there to Seattle and go up to Smith Tower. Everyone knows about the Space Needle. That captured the title of tallest building in Seattle and on the West Coast uh, from this building, but this is by far the better one to visit. So there you have it, the world's best antique skyscrapers. Um, if you'd like to see some in person, uh, you can come here to Pittsburgh the weekends of May 22nd and 23rd and then July 17th and 18th, I'll be giving private tours of antique skyscrapers. So if you find yourself in town, I'd love to have you join us. You can find more information about it. Uh, or you can follow me on Twitter, that's the best place, at Hauser Talks. Uh, in the background there's that Oliver building uh, Daniel Burnham's tallest skyscraper. Um, you can also go to my website, housertalks.com, and there you can download a free preview of the book if you'd like to check it out, including the New York and Chicago chapter. And there's a link for personalized uh, copies of the book. It makes a, a great gift 
25% discount for orders of 10 or more. And you can contact me on the website too if you have any further questions. So if you'd like to arrange for me to speak with your group, that is how Karen found me. And uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and uh, hope you've enjoyed the talk. Hello, Mark. Sorry, my screen's a little slow. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just want to say how absolutely fantastic that was. The combination of your wonderful stories and curious facts and those absolutely breathtaking images. It really was fabulous. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Peg Green for her really wonderful introduction. So thank you very much for that, Peg. And, and there she is. So thank you, Peg. That was really, that was fantastic. Um, do you or Victoria want to say anything before we go into the Q&A? Peg? Oh, oh she's muted. All right. Oh, mute. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Um, I do that all the time. You left me speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm glad you liked it. Mark, I just want to just say the, the images, both the historic ones and your contemporary ones, I never enjoyed uh, looking at images as much as the ones that you presented tonight. They were all so beautiful and... and um, and your photographs, which leads me to the first question. I don't know if it'll make me the winner of the book. <laughs> <laughs> You've got one. All right. Well, we'll one. <laughs> the best, best question, but where, where do you get the images and do you take the photographs yourself, the, the contemporary work? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'll start with the photographs, many of them. Uh, I did not take the one of me standing on a skyscraper that was taken by a drone guy <laughs> that took pictures of that event. Um, but I, I took, I visited uh, 47 of the 55 skyscrapers in the book personally and took pictures with my phone. Um, and, and, but I, I toured them and tried to find the most interesting parts of the buildings, you know, look for the highlights because I really do see this book as a little bit of a travel guide, you know, it, it in addition to telling the history of why the building's there, it says what you should look for. Mm -hmm. So I try to pick, you know, attractive buildings that still looked a lot like they did when they were built. Of course, the office spaces most have been remodeled, but often the lobbies are still in close to original condition. For instance, in the Woolworth building, I, I know, I'm sure all, all of you have been mm -hmm. there and those who haven't need to get there because it is mm -hmm. tremendous. Mm -hmm. But, um, and as for the old images, well, that's, old newspapers and uh, old photo <laughs> archives. And I illustrated the book with, here it is, my own personal antique postcard collection. Beautiful. So these are the images in the book, which I got on eBay. Thank you. Perfect, great. Well, we have quite a few questions, so I will get started, we'll get started in those. And I do want to apologize to those of you who may have raised your hand. I'm so sorry, we're not able to um, acknowledge you in that way. So could I ask you to submit your questions in the Q&A form? So, right, first question from Gerald Niemeyer. Um, Mark, could you tell us why the Pennsylvania Hotel cannot be saved? And what other buildings are subject to songs? Why can't the Pennsylvania Hotel be saved? Uh, this is, here, I start off swinging with this, I'm assuming is a building in New York. I, I must admit, I'm not familiar with what this it, is. It is, it is. I can so, answer that quickly. Oh, thank you. I turn it over to Peg, please. The Hotel Pennsylvania is a McKinley and White building, kind of later in the firm. And um, it is slated to be demolished for a, a super tall or a large building. Um, and the commission has looked at it. We've asked them to look at it and, and Landmark yet others have, and they have declined saying that it is not the best of McKinley and White. So that is why we can't save the Hotel Pennsylvania because the Landmarks Commission disagrees with us. Right. Well, th thank you very much, Peg, for, expa for explaining that. Um, 
Right, the next question. Now, this is a um, more uh, technical question, um, uh, Mark, but I'm um, Jeffrey Baldwin. Uh, what was the change in engineering science that enabled skyscrapers to stand up to, uh, um, you know, earthquakes and gales? Um, I think that it's the case that, uh, that, that certainly the technology, uh, there are all different aspects of the technology beyond just the structural. I mean, there's also how to get standpipes to supply water high enough that you can put fires out on the buildings, which that was a key early technology in order for them to go beyond to 10 stories or beyond. Um, I, I guess steel uh, was a major leap forward from the prevailing iron technology that preceded it. Uh, the iron is brittle under stress or bends under stress. And it also, uh, I believe it doesn't stand up to fire as well. And there were also additional technologies such as wrapping steel beams in, uh, in tile and things like that to protect them from fire. So, I mean, I think it, it's a whole panoply of changes that occurred bit by bit that you can see through the course, uh, many of the, the buildings in my book, each of them is illustrated uh, with an antique postcard, as I mentioned before. So you can kind of look and see over time how the look of the buildings uh, is changing. And this is also true of the skeleton inside the buildings. So, I, I mean, to the extent that that is a answer to the question, I hope. Um, I think that's, I think that's an excellent answer. Um, well, uh, uh, this is from uh, Steve Amiega, and he wonders, um, it could, could you possibly explain, or if you know, the historical significance of the lyric from Oklahoma? I went to Kansas City on a Friday, by Saturday, I'd learned a thing or two. They went and built a skyscraper seven stories high, about as high as a building ought to go. Do you know if that any historical significance to those lyrics? Well, I'm gonna give it a whirl. Good for you. <laughs> seven, seven stories high is a little bit taller than buildings were built pre-elevators. That's a long walk upstairs. But certainly as I showed that uh, image of, of, of um, Broadway in 1868, that was the accustomed height of buildings was five, six. There was one that was eight in Philadelphia that had no elevator. That's kind of a, uh, an early pioneer of the form, but I'm sure its employees were not thrilled with the fact that they had to go up seven flights of stairs to get to the top. But um, Kansas City has a great building. I didn't get a chance to talk to you tonight, but it's called the New York Life Building. And uh, so New York Life Insurance Company built a bunch of regional skyscrapers in the early 1890s, including one in Kansas City. And it's fun to look at, and there's a whole story about the business, but my favorite detail about it is that one of the, uh, one of the Masons got fired for showing up drunk. And so he snuck out the window on the eighth floor and took a nap on the ledge. <laughs> and we <laughs> discovered he was discovered by his coworkers who dragged him back in before he could roll off into oblivion. But um, it is one of the earlier ones that sort of the Palazzo style in the very early days, like when we looked at that, uh, the, the, the first equitable building, the, even when buildings were tall, the emphasis was still to try to make them look shorter. People weren't really sure what to do with a tall building yet. And, and Louis Sullivan is one of the people that's credited with embracing the idea of verticality. Great. Thank you, thank you. Um, Elena Lensky wonders if it's possible to obtain this webinar recording, where well, this is one that I can answer, and yes, it will be. We will, uh, we will be editing at uh, the beginning because we did start a, a little earlier than we'd anticipated, but hopefully that will be available in a few days. Jim Hunt wonders, Hunt, how did the world's first fireproof building burn down? Do you know the answer to that, Mark? Um. I will say that there's a lot of boasting in building advertisements about fireproof buildings, mm -hmm. and none of them are wholly true. I mean, I, to my knowledge, I'm not a fire marshal nor an architect, but fireproof is a relative claim rather than a definitive uh, claim. So th there, there were certainly lots of fires that were problems with skyscrapers and, and that th the need to have technology that could at least mitigate that danger was one of the essential uh, engineering 
questions that had to be settled before these buildings were built any taller. The equitable building, I didn't mention, but it, it relates to this question. That first fire with, with all the icicles falling out of the front of the, the, the charred window remains of that uh, equitable building, that fire led to the uh, creation of fire sprinkler laws in New York City. It was because of that fire that future con construction subsequently had to be equipped with sprinkler systems to put out a fire. Thank you. Um, this is from uh, David Hogarty. What are your thoughts on balancing the desire to preserve and the drive to innovate both technologically and, sorry, the question just went up a little bit, yeah. both technology and aesthetically? Um, I think sorry, I when, when skyline desecrators can become beloved landmarks with the passage of time. Absolutely, that's, I mean, that's a, I think that's a wonderful question. Uh-oh, we got a finalist here for the book. <laughs> um, I, I think that it relates to what you're going through now in New York and, and what they're going through in Chicago, this idea that I found it really interesting to see that buildings that are beloved, I mean, the equitable building is a, is a you know, a landmark. You know, it's got the paperwork. It's a New York landmark. It enraged people when it went up. The Flatiron Building, people, uh, especially the cognoscenti, you know, the 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 the, the architectural uh, experts, really did not like the look of the Flatiron Building. So the public loved it. Um, so on the first, on one hand, the, there's a there's a benefit of history of seeing how buildings are going to be uh, viewed by the public rather than snap judgment of how you feel about them today. That's interesting to know. Um, and I guess another part of that question is the idea of um, innovation versus preservation. And I mean, that's a, a long <laughs> subject that uh, each of you I'm sure could discourse on with much, much more informed than I can. I'll just say as a layman, as someone who's interested in these old buildings and, and really uh, treasures them and thinks that they're beautiful, um, that you know, there are trade-offs. Pittsburgh is not full of all of the old skyscrapers. That, that the, the, the slide that I showed of downtown Pittsburgh showing all these new skyscrapers in 1912 blasting past the 1896 skyscrapers well, only one of the old ones is still here and only some of the 1912 ones are still here and many of them have been torn down. And I think every time an old building gets torn down, some people are disappointed. Um, that is so it's a case by case basis. It's, there's not an easy answer to it, uh, but what we should, what is nice about the buildings that I've written about is that pretty much universally, they've now been accepted in each of their cities as landmarks as you know, buildings that carry great character and lend you know, an atmosphere to the city. So you could sort of, I think you can count on them sticking around, even if some of the other ones are gone. Right, thank you. Um, now I see it is, um, okay, I just wanna make sure that you're okay, Mark, answering a few more questions, because as you can see, we still have an awful lot of questions. And so I am going to apologize to members of the audience, because we're probably, well, quite clearly, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions we still have, but I will send these questions to Mark uh, after, the, after the fact. Um, uh, okay, this is, from Christopher this is from Christopher Stevens. Mm -hmm. um, what modern day tycoon would you like to see build a skyscraper today? And he says, no points for uh, Elon Musk. Oh. Uh, so any other, uh, do you, can you imagine anyone else who you think has a really great imagination who will come up with a, would come up with a wonderful skyscraper? Well, I mean, it, I'm sure he's doing a lot of good with his, with his money, but I, Bill Gates maybe uh, has some lying around. He, He's sort of a, a modern day model of Andrew Carnegie, um, who uh, built some interesting skyscrapers himself, as a matter of fact, though not as many as you might suspect. But um, it, it, it also uh, reminds me of a point that I make in my book that I think isn't always appreciated. And that is that while it's right to give credit primarily to the architects who 
you know, drew up the plans for these buildings, obviously. Um, a skyscraper only comes into existence because there is someone who wants there to be one. And that person, the client, the, the industrialist, the person who wants to create that investment, you know, he's driven, in some cases, she, there are some women's stories too in this book. I tried to find where I could, like Melly Esperson. But anyway, that person is, is also has a vision in his or her mind of what they would like the skyscraper to be. They certainly have opinions. I mean, you don't ask someone to build you a skyscraper without having, excuse me, without having a view of what it needs to look like. And in fact, there were two that I mentioned in my book, both in Chicago, that are perfect illustrations. One, the Monadnock building, which is just an austere brick tower, is that way because the, con or the, the, the client said, I want no decorations on my building. And Daniel Burnham tried and tried and tried to satisfy him with less and less, and John Root, his partner, until they finally came up with this, uh, basically a rectangle made of brick. And it's still seen as a classic skyscraper. And another one in Chicago is the Reliance building, also by Burnham. And this was for a client who said, I want a lot of light in my building. And so this building for the 1890s is surprising. It, it doesn't look like anything else of its era. It looks like it, it was went to the same time machine and went back from the future. It's just covered with these uh, plate glass surfaces and terracotta, unlike anything else. And both of them are because a millionaire said, this is the kind of skyscraper I want. So it, it, the question gets to that idea that while architects are clearly essential, also the person who asks for the skyscraper in the first place often has a big role to play in what it comes out looking like. So let's see Bill Gates build something exciting up there in Seattle. And Mark, can I just add to that? And without which, because I am sitting here on the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, and without the men and women of the building trades, there would be no uh, visions ever executed. So we, we thank those who labor and and who we celebrate daily here, even though it's empty right now, but everybody- Absolutely, <laughs> well put, well put. Um, let's, let's see, but this is from uh, Jonathan Lawson. And he's assuming the only way to cool the early skyscrapers was by opening windows and using fans. And he wonders what it was like in the offices in those summers. Now, obviously Mark, you weren't there, but um, <laughs> you can give it your best guess. Very, very true, very true. Um, no, that is the case. Um, an interesting thing that you start to notice if you, like me, begin to collect postcards of old skyscrapers is that many of them are shown with awnings on the windows. So it, that was a normal sight in 1910. Uh, your skyscrapers each had individual awnings on the windows. And, and yes, they had transom windows and, you know, a, a system where they were, they were engineered to allow the maximum light for the technology of the time and to get as much cooling. But I suspect that they, there may have been hot days in July where it was not quite so pleasant to work on the 15th floor of a 15 story building. Thank you. Um, now, Chris Nelson wondered if you could live in any of the buildings in your book, which would you choose? Oh, that's easy. Um, I, th there, there were two penthouses that are interesting to me. One is on top of Seattle's Smith Tower. Um, and in fact, I managed to get in touch with someone who used to live on, on the top of that one. Um, but it's pretty utilitarian looking inside. It's, it's interesting. There was a New York Times story about it some years ago, maybe a decade ago. And it certainly has a gorgeous view. Um, but the one that I really am interested in is the penthouse in the top floors of the Woolworth building which last I heard, I think it was listed in the 70 millions, but you get access to that, uh, that public, formerly public observation deck, which I can only imagine what a spectacular view it must be from that top floor. Now I understand it, it isn't currently, uh, it isn't currently, it may be on the market, but I don't believe they've found a resident, uh, at least last I heard. So if anyone in this audience knows uh, how they can, might be able to put me in touch with someone who would, a realtor who would like to show that property. Boy, I certainly would love to, to have a view of it uh, from up close. I, I think it's three or four stories. 
Okay. Well, if anyone in the audience does know, please, uh, please, uh, please, please type something in, and as I said, we'll be sure to pass these questions um, on on to Mark after the uh, after the talk. This is from Bruce McIntyre. Um, did any skyscrapers ever collapse while under construction or later? And he also wonders, what is the highest skyscraper that was ever raised? Do you know the answer? Well, for the latter, the, the second part of the question is, is, a, is a moving target. So, I mean, we've got one now, uh, but the, the Burj Khalifa, but if you, uh, if you read about these buildings, there's another one plan to be even taller also in the Middle East. Um, there certainly were more than I can think of an, an initial entire building collapse. Uh, one story that uh, recurs a lot in these old newspaper uh, accounts of the construction is something slipped or broke free from a crane. And there's at least two cases I can think of in Pittsburgh during construction of a skyscraper in the early 1900s, say 1902. 1905, where say a girder breaks free. And, and just imagine these girders at that time, this blew my mind, but um, there were no tractor trailers to haul giant steel girders to a construction site. This is, you know, horses, teams of horses, and they had temporary sort of uh, transport vehicles that were basically giant wooden wheels. And on the axles connecting the wheels slung underneath are these, you know, huge steel foundation girders at many, many tons, right? So if one of those slipped free of a crane uh, and hit a streetcar, say, that could be a problem. In fact, there's one in Philadelphia. There was a collapse on a construction site of a building in Philadelphia that almost killed one of the uh, owners. That's a story in my book too, but the whole building didn't collapse. Um, this is Peter Widener and his partner. Uh, this is also a, a Burnham skyscraper. I don't know if that's the one that the accident happened in. So it would happen, but that the founder, or rather the structure of that building, the steel cage, the skeleton that it's built on is, is probably too strong. You even saw the image from San Francisco, right? A violent earthquake, one of the worst the country's ever experienced, didn't knock down 1902, 1903 skyscrapers. It cracked them in places, it made them structurally weak, but they didn't all fall down, which is what I would have assumed happened. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just take a couple more questions. And, and Mark, I, I do want to say to you, because obviously you're not, you haven't probably been able to see all the questions. So if you want to defer um, awarding the books tonight, and we can send you the <laughs> questions and I can announce it oh. when I send. So it, it's, ent it's, ent it's entirely up to you. I think I'll I think I'll award them tonight, but we're still open. There's still the contest is still going. Okay, but well, here I, we go. I do want to say that people are free to welcome to reach me at my website is housertalks.com, H-O-U-S-E-R talks.com. And there's a at the bottom there's a form where you can contact me and, and I check that every day. So I'd be happy to entertain questions and, and uh, I can respond to the remaining ones and, and you know give that back to you, Karen, if you like. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That, 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 sounds, uh, that sounds good. Okay. So I am just looking now the pressure's on for the, <laughs> okay. Um, and some of these are, 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 uh, are comments. Um, let's see. Oh, this is from Victoria McCready. Are there any skyscrapers that seem over the top as if they're only built to be the tallest as opposed to be a labor of love? Oh, what a wonderful question. Are there skyscrapers that are over the top? Okay, you're gonna, uh, first of all, you've seized that, one of the books for sure. So I love this idea. And so many of these skyscrapers um, are gaudy, right? And the ones that I profile, um, it's interesting that some of the decorative motifs that we now read as being old fashioned, right? These classical or Renaissance motifs were really adopted for a couple of reasons. One, because this was the accepted, you know, taste of the time from that Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the School of Fine Arts in Paris, um, that was kind of the received wisdom of how great buildings were supposed to look. And this was, uh, emphasized and magnified at the Chicago World's Fair. So that was the style of building 
uh, to gussy it up with a lot of classical columns and, and decoration. But it was also to reassure people, right? That's also why you'd have beautiful lobbies and rooftop observatories is because you've seen how much these buildings just took over cities. And imagine if you were able to see nothing but Trinity Cathedral and other or chapel and other steeples um, to suddenly have these behemoths shooting up like dandelions everywhere. So um, mostly the builders were restrained by at least the idea that let's try to make this aesthetically appealing to the masses. Yet there were some examples where this was not followed. And I think my, again, I'm gonna come back to Smith Tower, which in addition to being strangely shaped, also from the beginning has lied about how tall it is and still does today. So everything you read about Smith Tower, you go to the Smith Tower website now, and it says that it is 42 stories tall, which is what the builder, uh, the son of the uh, Smith, himself, Lyman Smith died just before construction started. So his, his son was uh, oversaw that project, but they said it was a 42 story building. Um, if you look at a picture of the Smith Tower, look it up online, there's no way that that building is 42 stories tall. It's somewhere in the mid thirties. So um, I don't know whether they're counting. This happened sometimes in the early stories. I think uh, some of the ones along Newspaper Row off the Brooklyn Bridge, they would count their basement floors too as stories. So uh, there are many examples of buildings where the builders or the owners really, and Hearst was another great example, right? Of, of, of builders who wanted to impress the public with uh, you know, a, a bigger than any other building claim, or this is the most extravagant building of all. Um, I just love the fact that something that is obvious and easy to count, like the Smith Building's floors, is still something that they just <laughs> brazenly, bald-faced, lie to you and say it's 42 stories tall. Even if you count the extra floors and the little pyramid on top, it doesn't come close to 42 stories. There, the, the panel of elevator buttons in the elevator stops at 35. So I'm not sure where the other seven come from. Thank you. Um, okay, this, um, this will be our, um, our last question. And it's been pointed out to me, I, I've seen to have ended up favoring um, uh, male members of our audience tonight. So I, I apologize for that, but this is certainly from a female. This is from Barbara Shiotsu. Uh, you mentioned that you include several, I think five international buildings in your book. So what were they, Mark? Ah, okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, two of them are in Canada. There's the World Building in Vancouver, which was the tallest building in the Commonwealth, I think, for a time. Um, another one is in Montreal. It's a bank building. The name suddenly escapes me. But it's a gorgeous building with, where you can, uh, I guess, the ground floor, which is another extravagant lobby, now has a little bakery, so you can get a bagel and a cappuccino there. Um, that's quite nice. Uh, two in Europe. There's the one in Liverpool, which, because it's a port city, was a lot more favorable to American ideas than most of Europe, where they thought Americans are ruining their cities with these ridiculous constructions. We have beautiful centuries-old architecture. We're not putting any of those here. But Liverpool is a port city, so they've always been more uh, favorably disposed to the U.S. So they had there on the wharf uh, the tallest skyscraper in Europe for many decades. That's the Royal Liver Building. In uh, Amp not, I'm sorry, Rotterdam, there is a great building called the White House that is from the 1890s that's 10 stories tall. And its builders were brothers who had an oil refining business and had just visited New York City and visited a hotel called the Netherland. And their building uh, bears a striking resemblance to the old Netherland in New York. And the last one is a spectacular building that I haven't visited, but I really want to. And this year is a big year for it, by the way. It's called the Palacio Barolo, and it's in Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina. And it is the Barolo Palace named Mr. Barolo was the person who commissioned it. Um, he was uh, a manufacturer of cloth. And uh, anyway, the reason that's interesting is because he's from Italy. He was an Italian immigrant and he was very troubled by uh, the unrest and turmoil in the world. 
and how it threatened his native land of Italy, especially after the First World War. So he built this skyscraper, not just as an office, but with a sarcophagus in it, where they would, he wanted them to relocate the remains of Dante Alighieri. And that would be the new shrine holding Dante's remains. And so there is a, a, a sarcophagus in the lobby. Uh, Italy said, no, thank you. We do not want to give you the bones of Dante. And the man died very disappointed, but it would have been in, I believe 1921 was the 600th anniversary of Dante's death. And so this year is the 700th anniversary of Dante's death. So I need to see if the nice people the Palazzo Barolo would like me to come and, and say a few words about their skyscraper, but it is bizarre. It is not classical. It, it, its design is this sort of mix between uh, Art Nouveau and almost like uh, Gaudi from Barcelona, but that same, uh, it, and also looks like it's from Naboo in the Star Wars prequels. It's a mixture of all of those things. And it's built as a metaphor for the journey from hell to heaven that's in Dante's Inferno. So the bottom floors have sort of, uh, uh, they have monsters on the walls and, and they're lit from below like the fire. And then you go up through, you know, uh, purgatory and then the top is, is, is heaven. It's, I think it's 10 stories tall. It's a it crazy building. Sounds absolutely fabulous. And I think we should all go to Buenos Aires to see it. It looks really incredible. So, um, Mark, I'm just going, I'm going to read a quote from one of our audience members, and this is representative of so many other people, uh, so many of our audience. And uh, this is from LN. Your presentation was truly exciting. I look forward to your book and also viewing the recording of this talk again and again and again. Thank you. And I think we echo that because this was really absolutely sp splendid. Um, your extensive knowledge, again, those incredible images, your research. Um, we, it, it has been an absolute delight to have you speak here this evening. So Mark, thank you so much. And again, Peg, thank you for your wonderful introduction. Um, this is Victoria Denkel, our executive director. Victoria, would you like to say a few words now? And Peg, of course, if you want to say anything else. Okay, I mean, Victoria? I think that quote said it all. And I, I would say just, I encourage I, to go to Mark's website because it's really delightful in terms of the images and then just, you know, his wonderful book and to, uh, yeah, I think you'll enjoy it, so. And, and a beautiful quote by Peg Breen on the back. So. Yes, exactly. I'm wonderful. Um, so Mark, would you like to choose your two winners now? I absolutely would. I, I, I can announce that our winners tonight, first of all, I hope I got the name right, but uh, for the question about over the top buildings, Victoria, was it McCready? I think it was, but we, we can, we, we, can uh, we will double check that, but I think, I think, I think it was. So, a signed copy will be in the mail to Victoria once I get that uh, information from Karen after the, after the event. But thank you for your great question. And the other great question, well, there were many great questions, so this was a difficult choice to make, but I believe that for, uh, for coming up with a Broadway musical in Kansas City and, and the controversial seven story, which I don't accept that seven stories is the right height, but I want to give the other book to, is it Steve Yeager? Is that the name that I It was Amiaga. Ami, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm, well, I'm no, Amiaga. that was, that was, you know, you, I just said it once, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. yes. Well, that, that, uh, th that will be the recipient, he will be the recipient of my second book. So thank you all. Again, purely arbitrary and completely uh, subjective uh, judging criteria, but I thought those are both uh, great questions from a field of great questions. Yes. And I'll be happy to answer additional questions. Uh, if you want to forward those to me, Karen, uh, maybe I can have a, a, a sort of a Q&A type response thing. I can write out some answers. Of course. And maybe you'll find another winner. Who, who knows? Because there are some great questions I wasn't able to get to. So um, to your audience, again, um, uh, particularly those who ask uh, questions tonight, and I, I apologize if we weren't able to get to you, but uh, we so appreciate you supporting our talks. Um, again, a wonderful, wonderful book, 55 
uh, multi stories, 55 antique skyscrapers, and the business tycoons who built them. And that, of course, you will find, be able to purchase if you visit Mark's website. And perhaps, Mark, if you just mentioned the address one more time. Sure. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to, uh, to your group tonight. It was my pleasure and honor. Um, the website is housertalks.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter if you find this stuff interesting, Hauser Talks. Um, that would be great. In fact, there was a Twitter person that helped me know who, what was that building on the uh, front slide that I, I thought that was the Woolworth building at first, but the, I found it's the Liberty Tower down in the, the financial district, so. Right, well, that would be. And well, again, Mark, thank you so much. Peg, again, we really appreciate you making, making the introduction and, of course, our ongoing partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy. I just want to very quickly mention that next week's lecture, again, another landmark lecture, is Material Transfers, Metaphor, Craft and Place in Contemporary Architecture, and that's with Francois Boilac. And on Tuesday, May the 4th, we have a guide to artists, homes and studios with Valerie Valent. Um, I, with that, I'm going to say good night. I want to thank uh, Mark and Peg again, and of course, Victoria. Uh, good night and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.